Welcome back, friend. Dr. Grant Wiedenfeld here in the weeds, trying to understand Bell Hooks' oppositional gaze. Uh, this is part two, and <clears throat> I'm going to go into a little bit the differences first from Diawara's talk about Black spectatorship. And here she makes the point, you know, referring to Emmett Till, that Black male spectators are different than black female spectators in this environment. Let me read here. Uh, in their role as spectators, black men could enter an imaginative space of phallocentric power that mediated racial negation. This gendered relation to looking made the experiences, the experience of the black male spectator radically different from the black female spectator. Okay, what she's, what she's talking about here, if that isn't clear, is that for, you know, mainstream American movies and television, the, you know, there is the male gaze. It is, uh, <clears throat> it's, a, it's a white gaze, but it's also a male gaze. And so there's a pleasure in looking, especially looking at white women. That's denied, uh, especially during segregation, is, is very taboo and, and is this kind of forbidden desire for Black men. Well, they can, you know, indulge that desire when in, in the privacy of watching a movie. Um, so if, in a way, uh, you know, they can, they can kind of taste the, taste the forbidden fruit of that patriarchy, of that power over women. Um, in watching. Now, black, the black woman spectator, uh, you know, she, she is not going to, she's still facing this, you know, the patriarchy, the, you know, the, the sexism of, of the mainstream. Um, and there's, you know, so, so, she, so there's no kind of uh, pleasure that she can step aside from the, you you see how it's it's different for those two because the because the you know the mainstream media is different and it's oriented towards men not to women right and um <clears throat> you know she gives an example here from Amos and Andy not the main characters of course who who are men but uh the this character sapphire in it she she writes about it in another essay, but but, but uh, revisits here. And you know this this character is well. First, she talks about what Saf how she reacted to Sapphire as a kid. Basically, Sapphire is a villain. Uh, she was a foil. She was a bitch nag. She was there to soften images of black men. So you know Amos and Andy they seem sympathetic because they've got this. They've got this this mean sapphire coming after them. Uh, you know, the castrating it. You know, is, is <laughs> she's she's referencing Mulvey there, and you know the threat that women that women had toward men, um, and and she's representing that in this show. She's she was someone the white and black audience could, could hate. She's a villain, and <clears throat> uh, you know, jumping down to the bottom. Uh, not the image of desire. So she's not identifying, she, no, nobody is supposed to identify with this villain. And so in a way, uh, she, you know, there's, there was kind of the, the pleasure of, of hating the villain is something that she experienced as a kid. But then <clears throat> jumping on the page, she says, grown mat black women had a different response to Sapphire. Here's where we get to the oppositional gaze. They identify with her frustrations and her woes. They resented the way she was mocked. They resented the way these screen images because it could assault black womanhood, could name us bitches and hags. And in opposition, they claimed Sapphire as their own, as the symbol of that angry part of themselves, white folks and black men could not even begin to understand. So if, you know, as an older black woman, the only representation in this, in the show or the, or the, or the most prominent one is Sapphire. You know, how do you feel about that? Uh, you know, how do you take pleasure in it? And in a way for her, there's, uh, it's, it's almost, you know, seeing that uh, this is, 
this is how I'm seen. This is, uh, you know, how um, <clears throat> she's a representation of my mo minority within the minority s status uh, that, you know, nobody cares about me. I'm just there to be laughed at or, you know, or to serve other people. Um, and so in a way, you know, that there's, there's a, you know, she's, she's kind of like a subtle, subtle, you know, an image of that and, and in her fierceness, uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps a, a kind of heroic um, figure. So, you know, jumping down in the next, next paragraph, she says, there's basically three responses to this, you know, white mainstream media. And the, uh, you know, the, the inhumane uh, representations. Focusing on black women, you know, there's the one response is, okay, just don't watch. You shut out the Im image entirely. You just reject it. I'm not going to, you know, movies and television, not something I'm going to be involved in. I'm just going to listen to music. Um, <clears throat> now, the second is to uh, just enjoy it as it's meant to be enjoyed, to assimilate. So that's the second underline. There were those spectators whose gaze with the, was that of desire and complicity. Assuming a posture of subordination, uh, they submitted to cinema's capacity to seduce and betray. They were cinematically gaslighted. Word that became popular in the 2010s. Here she's using it back in the 90s, uh, originally from, you know, well, I won't go into the background of it. You can look it up. But, you know, the idea is that, uh, you know, Black women would would watch a character like Sapphire and say, oh, this is normal. This is a normal way to, you know, to treat um, grown black women uh, and, um, you know, to only see negative stereotypes of black, like this is blacks, this is, this is normal. So that's the, that's the, that's the second response. And then the third response is, of course, the oppositional gaze. And, you know, we're going to go into detail on that. So, you know, for, first she, she kind of overuses it here and says, she talks about her own experience, um, going back to see films as a young woman, uh, you know, having first rejected it, uh, you know, she comes back and has this op oppositional gaze. Not only would I be hurt by the absence of, of black female presence, there are no good black female characters, or the insertion of violating representation, I interrogated the work, cultivated a way to look past race and gender for aspects of content, form, language. Foreign films in the U.S. and independent cinema is mostly what she looked at. Okay, uh, so <clears throat> she's not ignoring uh, the race and gender, but at the same time as she's a critically aware of you know the, this problem of race here, she's she's also going to enjoy you know the content, the form, the language, um, <clears throat> whatever comedy or drama is going on. Uh, so. You know the the race and the racism of in in the films is is a, is becomes in a way just a seed for that opposition. It isn't the entirety of what uh, you know. I'm talking a lot about race, but that's not the entirety of what uh, the oppositional gaze is about, uh, or or what <clears throat> cinema is about. Um, she's just saying that for you know for black spectators, of course, race is you know, the first thing that puts them in a position of opposition. But from there, there, you know, there, there's these three different responses. And the one that she's promoting is uh, to, you know, maintain a critical awareness of that problem, but also to see, you know, the whole of the artwork. And, you know, here she cites Mulvey, um, reading more Laura Mulvey's provocative essay from a stand, you know, if, what if we what if we also acknowledge race? One sees clearly why black women spectators not duped by mainstream cinema would de develop an oppositional gaze, placing ourselves outside that pleasure in looking. Um, Mulvey argues was determined by a split between active male and passive female. Uh, so black black female spectators actively chose not to identify with the film's imaginary subject uh, because identification was disenabled. So basically she's saying that Mulvey was right about, you know, the, the, this kind of critical pleasure of the oppositional gaze. And 
sort of black women were doing this before Mulvey wrote this article. Uh, and <clears throat> you can understand why. So <clears throat> now she's going, you know, I'm, I'm going to skip over some of the details where she's critical of Mulvey. Uh, and not just Mulvey, but, of, you know, of a no number of feminist film theorists. And here she's, you know, saying that the, the problem is having a universal concept of woman that's supposed to cover everybody. That the concept woman effaces the difference between women in specific socio-historical contexts, between women I de de define precisely as historical subjects rather than a psychic subject. Uh, or a non-subject. So we can't just think about it abstractly as, ah, the woman, and this is, you know, this this commonality that, that all people share. Well, in doing that, you've, you know, you've erased people's, people's ethnicity and race, which is a part of their identity as well, and their differences in class, um, <clears throat> which I talked about in the introduction. So the... <clears throat> you know, feminist thought here for her is not just not just focusing on this category of woman, but breaking down these categories themselves that this fixed category of what woman is, uh, is, is not enough. That we need to get into the context of, you know, where, you know, if we're talking about people uh, thinking about where, you know, what their class is, uh, race, culture, uh, you know, sexuality uh, would would be <clears throat> uh, disability, you know, if you wanted to add on to where the direction this is heading, um, all the way down to the, you know, all the specifics of them as, as a person. So um, here she's criticizing feminist thought that that doesn't do that. She says, for it is only as one imagines woman in the abstract when woman becomes fiction or fantasy can race not be seen as significant. So here, what, sh what she's saying is pretty profound, and that's that in this abstract thought of just woman, uh, that in fact, this is that, this is that same, um, there's, there's something to the, the patriarchy, the fantasy of power uh, that's dominating, you know, dominating the world through concepts that is happening here. So, you know, the kind of the fantasy of the male gaze, there's a certain, there's a certain also fantasy element in just thinking about, oh, we can talk about all women with just this one word. I'm going to come back to this later. Um, so she's saying, you know, fe feminism has has a problem in the way that it's thinking itself. It's thinking in a non-feminist way. Feminist thought is something different. Okay, she um, also is going to criticize, uh, you know, so, so, so we already saw her kind of push back against Diawara. She's also going to criticize Black independent films um, like <clears throat> Spike Lee in particular. She's got to have it, his breakthrough movie from the, from I think 86. Uh, it says that Lee replicates mainstream patriarchal cinematic practices, that um, we still have a male gaze in here, uh, that this, this movie is still centered around men and, and that this woman is, um, you know, the, this character, but just the, the, the whole structure of it is, um, is patriarchal. And, you know, suggesting here perhaps why uh, Lee became one of the most successful black uh, independent filmmakers is because, uh, you know, he hasn't broken from the, patri you know, the patriarchal basis of Hollywood cinema. This is, I think, her suggestion. Now, what she's into here instead are art films. And so she talks about, you know, independent foreign films, as they were called at the time. Uh, it says, I was often the only black female in the theater. Um, I love this story. I remember trying to share with one of my five sisters the cinema I liked so much. She was enraged that I brought her to a theater where she would have to read subtitles. To her, it was a violation of Hollywood notions of spectatorship. I'm coming to the movies to be entertained. Um, when I interviewed her to ask what changed her mind, da, 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 she says, I learned there was more to looking than I had 
been exposed to in ordinary movies. And then Bell Hooks says, I shared that most of the films that I loved were all white. Uh, I could engage them because they did not have in their deep structure a subtext reproducing the narrative of white supremacy. So here it's, you know, the, the, race, the racist aspects of the film she's talking about is not just about the cast uh, being diverse. Here she's watching these all white art films, but, she, but she's nevertheless saying that, you know, connected to Mulvey, it's the structure of the narrative that's not about domination. Uh, this sense of deep structure here um, that would make the, you know, the spectator passive and, and th that art films and independent films are not like that. They foster this critical gaze. And for that reason, uh, they are anti-racist. Uh, later, later on, she has some comments about Julie Dash. Uh, some good, some bad. Uh, you know, Dash has a short film, Illusions, about uh, Black women working in Hollywood, and, and one, one in particular who, um, you know, the question of passing for white because she's light-skinned. Um, <clears throat> the... So what she calls for here is, you know, critical spectatorship is a site of resistance. Uh, black women actively resist the imposition of dominant ways of knowing and looking. Um, okay. Mantia Dior is resisting spectatorship is a term that does not adequately decries, describe the terrain of black female spectatorship. We do more than resist. We create alternative texts that are not solely reactions. So it's, it's not just about race and pushing back and rejecting. It's, it's this creating new, you know, creators, uh, which she herself, of course, is more than just a critic. She's also a writer, uh, you know, uh, writes um, text for um, <clears throat> other than just criticism. I'll put it that way. Okay. We, uh, so I love the list here. As critical spectators, Black women participate in a broad range of looking relations, contest, resist, revision, interrogate, and invent on multiple levels. She asks, she lists uh, work of Black filmmakers uh, from, <clears throat> especially from the 80s, Julie Dash, uh, among first of them. So there's a sense of not just being a creator as making your own art, but also being a creator in you know, the movies. And if you can oppose it by saying, you know, in that kind of discussion afterward and imagining what the film might otherwise be and, and uh, you know, enjoying it in your own way. There's, there's a freedom of interpreting uh, for you. You don't have to watch the movie and accept the story the way that the movie wants. You can, you can create, uh, you know, your own story uh, as you're watching. So um, finally, this point uh, that she's making about these dominant ways of knowing and looking, this is, you know, strung, strung through the text here is this, this sense of the, you know, this deep structures of where does racism, where does sexism come from? And, you know, talking about structure and system is the point of that is to think that this is not just a moral shortcoming of, <clears throat> oh, you know, somebody has a, you know, a bad idea in their head and that they, they should know better, but they're, you know, they're, they're, um, they're, they were just uh, not strong enough or giving into it or something. It's, it's, it's not the sense of individual morality. It's that, uh, I think she's pointing towards the idea that, that, the knowledge system itself, the, you know, the ways we think and talk are, is a whole system that is about domination. And so rather than, <clears throat> rather than, you know, having, okay, we have a good system of thought with just like, oh, there's just these, you know, individual, you know, once there's a couple bad apple flaws here of racism and sexism that we need to get rid of and then we're all fine. No, she's saying the reason it keeps coming back uh, and uh, is because there's something to the way of thinking underneath that is about dominating. It's not, it's not about equality or democracy. 
It's it's about um, <clears throat> it's about power, knowing better than other people, and or maybe there, there's something about the what I really think it's about is that the concept itself becomes fixed. That we start to have a very you know fixed idea of what words mean, of what of how the world is set up, and these you know thinking in stereotypes becomes just a just a, a fixed model for how we see the world and <clears throat> it's having that kind of fixed thought that's not uh that's that's going to be tied into you know these social fixtures of of you know one class is better and better than another whether whether that's race or sex or whatever even even if we got rid of race race and sex there'd be some other category that would um <clears throat> that would that would find the same thing so it's this abstract categorical thinking that is a problem and um here she's you know in the tradition of 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 hegel as well who's you know he sees this he sees the you know dialectic as this ongoing process um, that things need to be negated to create this higher synthesis that to get to the you know absolute idea uh you have to get through these kind of simple fixed forms um, <clears throat> to really get to, you know, the highest philosophy where you can see all the complexities and, and subtleties of something. Um, <clears throat> you know, Horkheimer and Adorno's Dialectic of Enlightenment, uh, you know, this is, which is a book that the culture industry in, is in, has this same theme that, you know, this enlightenment thought is not good enough because it, it started to become mechanical and have these fixed categories that, oh, you know, we figured everything out. Uh, um, <clears throat> that no, in fact, uh, there, you know, there are all of these, there's this fundamental flaw in trying to, trying to understand things in a fixed way. So, uh, you know, the way to, the way to overcome it is to kind of unlearn some of those things and challenge them. I think she's also, you know, suggesting the problem of fixed categories here, that there, you know, there might be this problem in the quote unquote Western tradition of Plato and Aristotle, and <clears throat> which is which is where these uh, categories come from, uh, in some respects, and that, of course, you know, they're, you know, Athens is known as the inventors of democracy, but that democracy was very classist. Now, you know, it wasn't equality for everyone; it was only landholding men. So, um, you know, maybe, uh, you know, I'm, 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 you know, picking up this kind of oppositional thought from her, uh, which, you know, we had talked about with Aristotle does his, you know, kind of classism and sexism, um, enter into his thought. Okay. So, um, you know, if I, if, if we want to push back against, uh, hooks a little bit here, we could say that there's, well, we might ask the question, is this oppositional gaze um, part of, you know, a Hegelian process, teleology, where we're, you know, we're going to refine our thoughts, we're, we're progressing towards some better understanding? Uh, or is this, you know, should we, should we put aside this idea of progress? And, you know, in some way, is this leading to, re you know, rejecting thought and categorical thinking altogether uh, and you know what is the status of knowledge and knowledge institutions then um, <clears throat> which is of course good to question but uh, you know the there's a there's a <laughs> there's there's a certain cyn cynical conclusion one one could, could uh, tie to that and that's uh, you know relativism would be one way to put that you know politically it's anarchism um, and you, which, you know, I, I, I push back against in, in my work and that, you know, saying that there's, uh, it, it's important to have, uh, law and institutions to, you know, to create this civil sphere and equality. Uh, it's important to have a state that it's, <laughs> it's, uh, utopian to, to have a, you know, a democratic life without a, without a state and, that's you know maybe the maybe the question that it would that um, one brings up with this school of thought.
That is uh, Bell Hooks, Oppositional Gaze.